My name, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Afisha Beckles. I am the Education USA Advisor in Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome to this afternoon's session that we will be covering today, the ABCs to a winning interview. So thank you to all of those who have joined us. So for today's session, it's a panel discussion. I have with me three really uh, expert guests who will help us cover this topic. And just to begin, we'd like to share a quick poll to get an idea from you all where you are joining us from today. So while you attend to the poll, I'd just like to go through a few pointers for this session today. So we would go through just a couple slides and then go straight into the discussion. While we are going through the discussion, we ask that if you have any questions, please put your questions in the chat and I will try to get the, those questions to our guest panelists just to make sure that we get through all of your questions in a timely manner. Okay, so great. I'm seeing we have a lot of people joining us from Central America. We have a few in North America. And some of you are in fact preparing for an interview. Great, so we do hope that this session today would be helpful. And of course, for those who aren't, yes, the information is definitely going to be useful just in case you do have a college interview um, in your near future. Okay, great. Great, so it looks like a majority of us are in Central America. I'm sad to say that there's no one from the Caribbean here, but at least I'm here to represent. <laughs> All right, so great. So thanks again for joining us. So we'll move forward with the brief presentation. So what is Education USA? So Education USA, for those who may not be familiar with Education USA, we are a global network of education advising centers and advisors uh, with the US Department of State responsible for sharing unbiased, accurate, and comprehensive information with students like yourself about studying in the United States at, higher education, at a higher education level. We work with students, parents, teachers, guidance officers, and we also connect US higher education institution representatives with students like yourself who want to go to the US to study. So we conduct our work via in-center activities, outreach and virtual activities like this. We do one-on-one -on -one advising with students. We offer webinars like this one, informative sessions, some of them in person. A lot of times now because of COVID-19, a lot of our work has gone virtual, but we have been doing these sessions both virtually and in person where possible. We offer workshops and even education, US, uh, education fairs where we connect you with representatives from various higher education institutions in the United States. So for you today, we have three guests who are joining us. So firstly, we have Jessica Chris, who is the Assistant Director uh, graduate recruiting and admissions from George Washington University. So hello, Jessica, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. We also have Greg Mann, who is the Associate Director of Admissions and Coordinator of Global Outreach from Dartmouth College. Hello, Greg. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you. And Mar Marjorie Von Ahn, who is a cultural affairs specialist at the U.S. Embassy in Guatemala. Hi, Marjorie, and thank Guatemala you. For City. Here. Thank you. Okay, great. So now that we have our guests and you know who we have working with us here today, I'd like to get straight into some questions, and I would like to start with Jessica. So, Jessica, could you tell us? What is the purpose of an interview and how long 
is it typically? Yeah, so an interview, the purpose of the interview is to learn more about you and your story. So we have obviously received your application. We see your resume and your test scores and your GPA and all of that information that you've provided us. But we want to learn more about who you are as a person and that's why we conduct these interviews. Most of the time interviews can be anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour and um, dependent on the institution you're interviewing with and the type of interview that you're completing. But really, we're just looking for a conversation to learn more about who you are. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jessica. And um, I'll ask you, Greg, could you tell us what type of person would typically be interviewing a student? Who could the student expect to meet at the interview? Sure. So in the undergraduate context, it's going to be different a bit than from the graduate context. Um, in most uh, admissions processes for processes for undergraduate schools in the US, you're going to be meeting with one of two people, maybe three. Uh, they are either an admissions officer, so someone who reads applications, but isn't necessarily a graduate of that institution, somebody who works in the admissions office as an administrator, or it might be an alumnus. Um, for Dartmouth, the admissions office does not conduct interviews, although I do know schools that do offer admissions office interviews. We offer alumni interviews. So these are people who graduated from Dartmouth in years past who interview uh, prospective applicants and students. And then the other per person you might get an interview with is a current student. Um, so we do have admissions uh, fellows or interns who work in our office who conduct interviews, as well as senior students at Dartmouth. So again, I'm speaking just for my institution in this case, but I do know other schools where there are all types of students who might do interviews for the admissions office. For us, it's just uh, senior year students, as well as um, some of our interns that work in the office. So you, for, for, for us, it will be either an alumnus or a current student. And then, of course, in some cases, you have those admissions office interviews as well. Okay, um, that's... I would say for the really quickly, sorry, the, for sure. graduate school, sometimes you'll get an interview with a professor or a faculty member, but I'm sure Jessica can talk more about that. After. Yes, I was actually going to ask Jessica if she could share a little bit of insight in terms of how it might be different at the graduate level. Yeah, so on the graduate level, rather than um, alumni interviews or current student interviews, which I know is popular on the undergrad level, we are looking more with administrators. So as Greg mentioned, this could be faculty, this could be a staff member. Uh, for Specifically for GW, we are looking at assistant deans who do these interviews. So you are meeting with some top level administrators for these interviews. Okay, I see. So what i'd like to do now is just take a peep at the chat to see if we have any questions coming in and nothing just yet so i'll move forward with some prepared questions and i'd like um, to bring marjorie into the conversation because i know marjorie you work on uh, scholarship programs at the u.s embassy and you could definitely share some insights on um, your experience, based on your experiences with interviews, what are some of the things to avoid doing or saying in interviews? And then I'll ask Greg and Jessica if you want to add anything to that. Thank you, Afisha. Well, um, I manage very different programs, so it's every scholarship has different goals. So I think one thing that a candidate should definitely avoid is going unprepared into an interview because this is something that you can tell right away. If the person doesn't have a clear understanding of the objectives of the program, that's definitely not gonna leave a positive impression. And the panelists who are all very familiar with the program, they will notice it very briefly. On the other hand, if you have prepared for it, if you have researched, this shows a sort of um, respect to the time of the other panelists and it shows your commitment to the program. Okay, thank you so much, Marjorie. And Jessica or Greg, anything you'd like to add in terms of what students should avoid doing? Marjorie's already touched on it, but it's really, really important to come prepared. Um, one piece of advice I like to give students, whether it's talking to an admissions officer or an alumnus uh, or a student, is come prepared with questions, but come with, compared with questions that cannot be answered by Google. Come prepared with questions that, you know, don't 
comes to an interview and asks what, how many students go to the school. If you just Google Dartmouth College, it'll tell you how many students go to Dartmouth College. Ask something more about um, specific programs or specific experiences that the interviewer has had, because it's going to be more informative for you and it's going to be less of a waste of the time for the interviewer to tell you something that you could have found doing your own research. So I think Marjorie kind of hit the nail on the head and that's just a little bit of a, a piece to, to remember as well. Um, that, that's my type, tip there. Okay, thank you. And well, the, the, um, the next question was actually going to be about good practices. So I'm glad that you all touched on something that's really important that the student needs to be doing research before the interview uh, in terms of their preparation. But um, are there any other good practices or things that the student should mention? And Jessica, maybe I could ask you this question. Yeah, especially on the graduate level, what we're really looking to hear about is your leadership experience. So you come with your resume and we've already seen your resume at this point, most likely. So we're looking for something that's in addition to your resume. So elaborating on leadership positions you had, whether that's at your job or whether that's in an organization outside in your personal life and bringing some type of concrete example as well that you can talk about. So a personal anecdote, a personal story that you can share related to that leadership experience, that's really going to add a lot to the interview. Okay, thank you so much, Jessica, for adding that. And um, maybe Greg, you can give us an idea of, is it something that's always required? Does a, is a student supposed to expect that they will need to do an interview depending um, on if it's a scholarship or whether it's for a specific program? Should a student be prepared, always be prepared for an interview or is it something that is not usually a requirement? This is a good question. So it's really going to vary again by institution and program and level that you're applying to. And this again goes back to the point about doing your research beforehand to know what the process is. So for Dartmouth, um, our interviews are optional. So you can actually turn them down and not everyone gets offered one just because we don't have enough alumni to cover an interview for every one of the 20 plus thousand people who apply to the college. Although in certain regions, we do offer interviews uh, for all the students because we have more alumni located there it's by geography. Um, and you want to see, does it, so in Dartmouth, the cases we have alumni interviews. You want to check if in another school, it's uh, through the admissions office and you want to make sure you register that way. So you have to kind of do your homework. I know every undergraduate program, even within Dartmouth peer group, some don't offer interviews at all. And if you reach out and ask for an interview, you're kind of asking a question that you probably could have find out, found out the answer to on their frequently asked questions page. Um, and for us, like we reach out to you. So I get students every year who have already applied and say, hey, I'm wondering about an interview. And it's kind of like, kind of just have to wait for the alumni to reach out for, to you and set up that, that appointment. So it's going to vary again by school, by program, by level, um, all of those pieces there. Okay, that's interesting. And maybe I could shift to you, Marjorie, because then I'm thinking in terms of a scholarship program. Um, I'm thinking this might be a case where an interview would be mandatory. Am I correct? Yes, Afisha. I do not know any scholarship that doesn't require an interview. There are different types of interview. I have, I have worked with some programs where interviews are recorded in a platform or somewhere you do them in person before COVID or now virtually. But I would say interviews are a key step in all scholarships because they will tell you all the things that you cannot take out from the paper, from, from the exams. And I, I think going back to the best practice, I would like to point out something um, is to go into an interview with a mindset of empathy. Think about what the person on the other side of the screen or of the table is looking for. Do not go in the interview wholly self-centered in what you want, but think about what are they looking for and how do you fit into that? Great. I like, I like that, um, Marjorie, in terms of them being empathetic. And it does lead me to ask, do, do you all think that there's a specific interview etiquette that the student should keep in mind, things that are expected? I mean, we might be dealing with young persons who have never 
been, been in an interview before um, and they may not know some things that would just not fly. <laughs> so maybe in terms of interview etiquette, Jessica, is there anything that you think students should keep in mind? Yes, so of course, the number one is dress to impress and dress for success. That's always the biggest thing, even though we are living in a weird virtual world right now, and you're probably going to be doing most of your interviews like this on Zoom, you still need to dress for the part. Uh, make sure that you are wearing at least a nice shirt <laughs> and pajama pants on the bottom, but um, and make sure that you're in a space where it's also professional looking. There's not going to be many distractions behind you, such as if you have a pet or a family member walking around behind you, you can always use a Zoom background or, or something like that. Um, so just making sure that you're professional looking is, is the first step to a good interview. Great, thanks so much, Jessica and Greg. Anything um, on your side that you could think of? Well, yeah, I think just a couple other best practice tips, uh, things to be thinking about is the interview is really a two way street. So the best kind of interview is going to be conversational and it's going to be an opportunity for you to learn as well. It's not just about trying to impress somebody. It's really trying to show you who you are, um, maybe aspects of yourself that you weren't able to elaborate on in your application or elaborating more on an aspect of your application that just didn't have enough in it because you ran out of space or you ran out of time. Um, and then also to, to ask questions and learn because this is an opportunity for you to talk to somebody who's been through the process for Dartmouth, as I mentioned, our interviews are geographic. So if you are living in Mexico, you're likely to get to get, to get an interview from somebody from Mexico who went to Dartmouth or somebody who lives in Mexico who went to Dartmouth. And this is a really cool opportunity for you to understand, okay, what's it like to travel all the way to this small town in Hanover, New Hampshire to go to college? And I think that that's really beneficial. So keep an open mind, two way street and uh, be, be prepared for the interview is super important. Okay, thanks so much, Greg. So I see we do have several persons joining us in this session. So again, thank you so much for being here. I just want to encourage you, the audience, please send us your questions. This is all about you and getting you prepared for a college interview. And while we do have some things that we want to get asked of our guests, we really want to hear from you because we may not have thought about everything. So please put your questions in the chat and let us all have a conversation. So um, just going back to something Jessica mentioned that most likely your interview is going to be virtual. Something that I had thought about pre-COVID-19, um, was it expected that a student would have to travel to the US to be interviewed or um, were interviews typically done virtually even pre-COVID? Is it something that um, when hopefully things go back to normal, could a student expect that they would have to be in the US to be interviewed or that they can do it from their home country? Um, maybe Jessica, you could share some information on that. Yes, yeah, so as far as for the institution that I'm working with, with George Washington, we always do international interviews virtually. Uh, we don't require anybody to travel all the way to Washington, D.C. in order to do their interview, especially thinking that we do have a lot of students coming from Asia, from India, from China. So that would be a very long trip to get here. Um, but of course, it varies by institution. I would say most are flexible when it comes to long term travel that that's um, that we can do it virtually, especially now having all of this technology at our fingertips. Um, but again, every institution is different, and I'm sure Marjorie can talk about um, how different scholarships are as well. Marjorie, anything that you'd like to add? Yes, uh, so in the case of in Guatemala, before COVID, we, do, we used to do the majority of the interviews in person, but we would also have the option for fellows who are applying from rural communities that can be eight hours away by a bus. So for them, we would offer the option of a Zoom interview, but then you also have the challenge of having internet connectivity. So I think this is something that we struggle a lot with in my country, and I know in several others too, that there are frequently electricity shutdowns or loss of internet. So I think this is something that you should look into if you will have a, an online interview to have a backup. 
Okay, thanks so much, Marjorie. So I do see that we have had some questions come in to the chat. So let me just take a look at those. I did see someone asked um, are interviews more like an interrogation or a conversation and Greg you did touch on this very briefly so maybe you could um, just explain again what the expectation is. Yeah I think ideally interviews are like a conversation as opposed to an interrogation. It's yes. an opportunity for you to get to know um, somebody who's a representative or a faculty member in the case of Jessica or a an administrator in the case of Marjorie uh, for a program or for a school and at the same time to introduce yourself um, in a face-to-face -face medium whether that's virtual or in person uh, to the last question you had asked is just uh, for, for us at, at Dartmouth and for undergrad programs we did for the geographic interviews offer some students in person so if you lived in Guatemala City and an alumnus from Guatemala City was going to interview you they would you would work it out with them whether you wanted to meet at a coffee shop and talk there or if you wanted to just meet on zoom because traffic in Guatemala City is not not always the easiest to navigate. Um, but that uh, that again it's going to vary from school to school, but it definitely should be ideally more of a conversation than an interrogation. Great. So that means don't be worried. You're not going to be interrogated. Just be prepared and it's a conversation. Great. So thank you so much, Greg. And another question that came in, what kind of activities or extracurriculars can demonstrate or show that we have leadership? So Jessica, maybe you could touch on that. Yes, uh, on the graduate level, I would say that a lot of a lot of our students are coming from diverse backgrounds. So we have students who are already professionals and have work experience. So if you're coming from that background and you've been working for a few years, you should pinpoint different projects that you've done in your work life, um, whether that's managing a team or managing a project that would really show some leadership skills there and just pinpointing on that. You know, if you're coming from undergrad and you you just graduated, that's really where you can talk about any student organizations you were a part of. If you were a leader in one of those organizations, you could talk about group projects that you've done in class and how you took a leadership role in that. And then any volunteer experiences or even like church experiences that you have, really anything outside of the classroom as well, where you've taken charge and really shown your leadership skills. We love to hear those personal anecdotes. We love to hear your story. So any story that you have to share, we would love to hear that. Okay, thanks so much, Jessica. And Greg, at the undergraduate level, is there um, something specific or any type of activities that students should be maybe highlighting in their interview that demonstrates their leadership abilities? Yeah, I think there's often a perception that in the U.S. we're expecting you to be the captain of the football team or like doing these 10 different president of 10 different clubs. And the, the truth of the matter is we're very understanding in that many cultures and countries outside the United States don't offer these kind of programs, especially to high school students. Um, there's a lot of countries around the world where you go to school school and then you go home immediately after school because you haven't even had lunch yet. Um, and that's totally understandable. So the way I like to frame it for students applying, especially from international backgrounds and from international school settings uh, that don't have a kind of American style curriculum or experience or US style curriculum or experience is to think about it this way. When you're not sleeping and you're not doing your homework or studying, what are you doing with your free time? And there isn't really a right answer to that question. It, there is no, like I said, you, you know, there's this perception that you need to be the leader of everything, but that's not true. Um, the analogy that I like to use when creating a campus community at the undergraduate level is we think about it kind of like a play, right? You need some lead actors and actresses who are going to be the more vocal, extroverted type leaders out in front, but you also need stage managers who are in the background, making sure that everybody's in the right place. You need a director. Um, who's also kind of organizing the theme of the play. You need people who are going to write the script and script writers tend to be the type of people who kind of close themselves in their room and just write all day. They don't tend to be the people who are necessarily out there making great, great speeches. They're the brains behind the operation and you need audience members who just enjoy watching the play, right? And so that's the point of this. It's not about one specific thing or one specific leadership opportunity. It's really just about building a community. And so in order to do that, we just want to understand kind of who you are and what you do in your free time when you're not um, in school and doing your work. Uh. Okay, that's quite interesting. And I'm glad to get that perspective that I could also share with uh, 
potential undergraduate students here in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I'd like to go back to the chat because the same person did have a second part of their question. And I think this one may be better, better for you, Jessica. Uh, so since a PhD is so specific, would the interview be conducted most likely by a professor of the department or could it be conducted by someone else? Yes, so on the PhD level, most of the time, the PhD admissions process is being handled completely by faculty members and by the uh, the faculty directors for that program because like you, you mentioned, it is very specific what they're looking for. Um, I know at least at, uh, at George Washington, at the School of Business where I've been working, we our faculty members handle completely the PhD process and you would have to schedule time with them for an interview and uh, schedule time with them for any questions that you would have. You'd have to reach out directly to the faculty. Okay, thank you so much, Jessica. And um, going back to you again, because this other question that came in does ask about graduate school uh, interviews. Are there suggestions for graduate school interviews? So I think we've covered um, a lot of, about that, um, but they've also asked, how should we address the tell me about yourself question? And I will um, start with you again, Jessica, on this, but then I'll definitely want to hear from Marjorie after and then Greg as well. I love this question, the tell me about yourself question. So this is what I always tell students is I have your resume. Most likely I have your resume in front of me when you enter the, the chat room or the physical room for an interview. So I don't want a regurgitation of your resume when I, when I ask you to tell me about yourself. I want to hear what's outside of the resume. Who are you? What are you interested in? What are your goals? What do you, you see yourself doing in the future on the graduate level, at least you, since we are focused a little bit more on the professional side, we want to hear what your goals are. We want to hear more than just what's on your resume. So instead of regurgitating your resume, tell us more about yourself. Great. And Marjorie, anything that stands out to you when it comes to answering that question? I completely agree with Jessica because I think we have all been in a situation where you ask this question and what you get is um, the summary of, of the CV. But I would just add a caveat. Tell me about yourself means tell me what is important for you that matches with this program. So that you make that exercise tells a lot about how much you know what you want and how much you know about the graduate program, the masters or the scholarship that you are applying to. And the way I'd like to explain this is think about the person who is interviewing you. They might easily interview 15 persons in a day and it's hard to keep track. What do you want that this person remembers about you at the end of the day when you're having the discussion, when you, when you have interviewed 15 persons, what do you want them to remember? That's a really good point because I've actually sat on interview panels for different reasons. And by the fifth interview, it gets hard to keep track of who you've seen for the day, but there's always somebody who stands out for some reason. So you want to be that student that stands out. That's a really great point. And Greg, anything that you would like to add to that? Uh, no, I think Marjorie and Jessica really hit the nail on the head. I think uh, finding a way to draw connections, uh, uh, kind of reiterating Marjorie's point, but in the context of undergraduate programming, mm -hmm. is when you tell me about yourself, it's the two way, again, I like to use this analogy like a two way street. It's the two way street of why are you a good match for Dartmouth and why is Dartmouth a good match for you, kind of without being so explicit about it, but more to say, like, I'm going to give you just a random example that I make up off the top of my head, but I, you know, I'm really excited about environmental engineering and I know you can see from my resume that I've taken these courses or done this research in biology, but what I'm really looking forward to, which I didn't get into my resume, is this specific faculty member I read about at Dartmouth who's really, really on the cutting edge of this renewable energy research that I think would be a good match for what I'm interested in. So like, that's what I mean by the two-way street. Like you've yeah. talked about what you've done without recur necessarily regurgitating specifically the project that you've already had in your resume and then connected it to what you're interested in at Dartmouth that you obviously wouldn't have written about 
other than in the application, which the alumnus didn't read, they just saw your resume. So that, that would be like my example of what Marjorie said in the undergrad okay. context. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Greg. And that does um, really touch a bit on the next question that we have coming in from the audience. So someone has asked, when you suggest to be prepared for an interview, what exactly do you mean apart from researching the website? Um, in the interview, are we asked about the history of the university? So maybe, uh, Jessica, could you share some insight on that? Yeah, so as far as the history of the university, anything like that, at least on the graduate level, we really don't get much into that. Um, but kind of going off of what Marjorie and Greg said in relation to you connecting yourself with the university, in order to be prepared, you should find these connections. Uh, for example, I always tell students, tell me what your goal is and how you see this program and our university helping you achieve that goal. And that's where you need to bring in, well, I saw this faculty member teaches this class and that will help me learn about this, which will help me re receive a job in this. So it, it all kind of comes together. And that's really what you need to be researching is how you can connect the university to your goals and how it will help you achieve what you're looking to do. Great, so that really um, helps us to see where the interview is about the connection between the student and the school. And that's really what the student should be focused on demonstrating during the interview. Um, bearing in mind students, they've seen your resume where needed and they've seen your application. So it's all about learning about you a bit more and how you fit with the institution that you're applying to. So there's another question that has come in from the audience. So someone is asking this year due to COVID-19, um, what happens if I couldn't complete the volunteer hours? Would that have any impact on the interview or would it show a lack of leadership or lack of humanity? Um, Greg, would you like to touch on that one? Sure, I think again, this is all about context. Of course, with COVID, we understand that you haven't had the same opportunities you would have had if it wasn't for the pandemic in order to work with people in a face-to-face -face manner or be in person in certain instances and events have been canceled and maybe you were in another popular thing we see in undergrads is like Olympiads programs and those competitions have been canceled or Model UN, which are tend to be more international kind of extracurricular activities. We get that, it's always about the context. And so we're not gonna penalize you for something that's completely out of your control um, and just to build on a little bit on the last question that relates to undergraduate education, and I think just in general, it's never a bad idea to not only look at the, the website of an institution or program, but to like do a little bit bigger, dig a little deeper, right? Like say there's a faculty member or a class you're excited about, like read a little bit about that faculty member and what they do. You know, read, I always say read a school, a school's newspaper. Every school has its own uh, institutional newspaper. Look at social media you know, many departments or at least uh, parts of, of schools and colleges have their own Instagram account, or their own YouTube account, and you can kind of check out videos and interviews and programs and read stories. Some of us have blogs. So I just wanted to point those resources out. I you know for Dartmouth undergrad, we have blog, Instagram, uh, YouTube channel. I mean, like there's so many resources out there. And if you just read the front page of the website, you're probably just gonna be like, this is boring. It sounds the same as everybody else. So you want to dig a little deeper to find out um, some of those other pieces as well. And Jessica, I would assume the same for George Washington University, that there are a lot of resources students could use. Oh, yes. I, I think the social media has been the biggest thing with COVID. I know that our school has been updating social media with the big announcements that have been made and and different things, but we also have a hashtag, hashtag only at GW, where students use that to talk about uh, interesting things that have happened to them on campus. Uh, as an alum of GW, I used it all the time, every time I'd meet a politician or somebody famous on campus, just walking to class. So that's something that I always recommend to students to look at because it's not necessarily the institutional focus, that's coming from the students and you get that student experience. Thank you so much, Jessica. And Marjorie, I'd like to ask, 
because this question is something that has come up. Can a student decline an interview? Is that recommended? So I think we have to um, find the difference between uh, undergraduate programs, graduate programs, and scholarships. In the case of scholarships, um, you cannot decline the interview. It's a very important step in the process. I mean, I'm trying to think of a situation that might require it, but I think interviews can always be rescheduled or postponed. But in the case of scholarships, it might give the wrong impression if you ask to cancel it, unless you have a very strong reason. But I would really advise that you take the interview. And I think along your life, you will always have to deal with interviews in different points of your life. So it's, it's a wonderful training. Um, the name of this webinar is Winning and an Interview. And I think just the fact that you made it to the interview, you already won because you already made that first cut and you made it there. So take it as a lesson. Whatever you receive at the program, get into the program or, or not, you are learning a lot by doing it. Great. Thank you so much, Marjorie. Um, there's a really interesting question that has come in from the chat. And I'd like Greg to maybe touch on this. How good is it to add social media in the resume? And do you check it before the interview? We don't check and we advise our interviewers not to check student social media. So we don't, we don't go down that rabbit hole. Um, you can list it as something that you do if you do it in kind of an extracurricular capacity. But I wouldn't, like if you have a vlog that's related to politics in your home country and that's a space where you uh, find kind of intellectual engagement, you can put that on your resume. If you just have a personal Instagram or YouTube channel, I wouldn't put that on your resume. I don't think that that qualifies as something um, outside of, uh, of an, that it qualifies as something that I would consider an engagement. If you're really engaged in sports or fashion or some kind of following on uh, social media and that's something you put time into, um, then, then yes, but for just personal enjoyment, then no. Okay, so only if it adds value. And Jessica, on the graduate side of things, do you all typically look at someone's social media prior to an interview? Uh, not, no, um, no. Even if somebody puts like an Instagram handle or something on their resume, we wouldn't look at that. Uh, if we do look at something, it would be LinkedIn. We do utilize LinkedIn a lot to connect with students so and, and applicants. So. If you do have a LinkedIn or you are trying to use LinkedIn, I always recommend uh, doing like a LinkedIn workshop and really working on that and making sure that's that's up to date. Um, and then Greg kind of mentioned this as long it's as long as it doesn't add some type of value. For example, I did have a student who was running an online magazine and she sent that link and that obviously added some value to her application. But as far as like personal Instagram, Facebook, we don't look at any of that. And Marjorie, for our scholarship applicants, do, do you typically look at their social media? No, we, we do not. As Jessica and Greg pointed out, unless I'm thinking of an example of an activist who ran a campaign on social media and shared the link to that campaign, that is something we would look at, but not at personal accounts. Um, that is not relevant for the process, I believe. Okay. All right, great. So that's it in terms of social media. So again, students, you don't include it unless it adds value to your application in some way, and you don't need to worry that they are looking at your social media. So another question that I'd like to touch on is most interviews end with, do you have any questions for me? What are some good questions to ask and what are some questions to avoid asking? So. I'll go to you, Greg, and um, I'll also invite both Jessica and Marjorie if you'd like to add to what Greg has said. Yeah, I would say my rule of thumb earlier is try to avoid asking questions that you can find the answer to on Google. Like, does your school have biology? You can look that up. You know, how many students are in the undergraduate program? You can look that up. I think better questions to ask are things you came compare prepared with. Again, this is always about context. Marjorie's touched on this, Jessica's touched on this. Like, there's very big differences between an undergraduate interview, a graduate interview, and a scholarship interview, and there's very big differences between 
undergraduate interviews between schools. So if you're talking to an alumnus who's a very recent alumnus, they might have, or a current student, they're probably gonna have better information for you about what's going on currently. Whereas if you talk to somebody who graduated in the 1970s, 80s, or 90s, they probably have a, diff a little bit different perspective on the institution. It's not that it's not a valuable one, it's just a different one. And so you wanna maybe think about questions related to their experience specifically from what you learned in the interview. Um, Cause they might not know specific, you know, somebody who graduated in 1984 might not remember or know about what the current, you know, dance groups on campus are. Um, and so that you, you kind of have to feel your way through that and use uh, social cues in a, in a way to fi figure out where the conversation should go at kind of towards the end of the interview when they offer you the space to answer questions. Great. So the students should prepare, but also um, bear in mind that they need to play off of what is actually taking place in the interview as well. Okay. Jessica, anything you'd like to add in terms of those types of questions that the students should ask? Yeah, I think that questions around student experience and what they they can expect more as like a cultural background rather than like Greg said, don't ask something that you can Google um, because you can Google it, but asking more of what's the culture like, what's the feeling like on campus, what is this program, you know, how is this program going to help me achieve my goal, how how can I integrate myself into this program? Those would be good types of questions to ask. And then also just asking about next steps. Like, what can I expect next? Can I expect you to reach out to me? Do I need to reach out to you? If I am accepted into this program, what should I be doing to prepare from now until I receive that acceptance letter? So just playing out what's going to be your next step so that not only it shows that you're prepared and you're ready and you're waiting to see what happens, but also it will help you create a plan and, and give you a little bit more, uh, put you a little bit more at ease because you know what the process looks like. Great, thank you so much, Jessica. And Marjorie, anything that you would like to add as well when you're dealing with your scholarship applicants? So I subscribe to what Greg and Jessica said, very important because um, asking something that is on the web page will give the wrong impression. Um, so what I would say is sometimes we are in this culture where you have to act fast, respond fast, know the answer to everything, but it, it is also okay to take a moment and think because it sometimes happens that you don't have the response to what they're asking or that you just need a moment to think. And I think that's also a valid thing to say, uh, to ask to repeat the question or to say if you can take a moment to think about it. I think that's a valid response too. Okay, great. So um, that gives you some ideas, students, in terms of the things that you should be asking and also what you should avoid um, asking. So definitely anything that you could Google or find on the website about the program is not something that you want to ask. You want to ask questions that will give you a bit more in-depth insight into the institution or the program. And you want to ask questions that will guide you in terms of what your next steps would be. So uh, considering, and I think we did touch a bit on this before, but um, maybe we could talk a bit more in depth. Considering that many interviews will likely be held virtually, what are some things I can do to stand out? Um, Greg, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, I think it's not necessary, like necessarily a big difference between virtual and in person when it comes to standing out. I think you're going to stand out for the perspective that you bring and the story that you tell more so than the, you know, you're not going to wear a funny hat or, or do something different just because you're a virtual versus um, in person. And so I think just the same things we talked about already in the presentation about being prepared, about um, understanding the, the institution and feeling out the conversation is the most important thing. It might be a little bit more difficult if you're more of a uh, in-person type uh, of an experience, but I think the benefit for most people in you know younger generations who are probably here at, as applicants 
um, is that you have a lot of experience with this. I would say the important thing is to give grace to those interviewers. Maybe you have an older faculty member, in the case of Jessica, I don't want to speak on behalf of graduate students, but like older alumni, like for us, like Dartmouth has alumni that graduated in the 1950s and 1960s and maybe aren't as good at using Zoom and doing things in a virtual way. They were the type that would have liked to instead have met you in a coffee shop. And so meeting them with that grace of understanding that, you know, maybe the camera's tilted wrong, maybe they're having trouble with sound and just being patient would probably get you a lot of kind of uh, uh, grace back from them and their report, as long as you're able to be flexible um, in dealing with those kind of little technical difficulties that come up from living in the Zoom world that we live in right now. That's a great point and it's not something I would have considered. So thanks so much for bringing that up, Greg. And um, Jessica, do you think that there are things the student can do to stand out? Yeah, I think I think what Greg said is perfect, um, especially on the graduate level. We are using, we're talking about faculty, and I've sat in on some of the virtual classes, and it does take some of our faculty members a little bit to figure out how everything gets put together and they get their camera on. So having that grace and just being patient is really great. Um, also, doing a sound check beforehand, making sure your internet is working, making sure your camera works, make sure your microphone works, make sure you have headphones and you have a nice space that you can be sitting and nobody's going to come and bother you. Just make sure that everything's going to go smoothly so that there are no hiccups when you get in there. And then everything we've said before, it's the same interview, just rather than being in a coffee shop, rather than being in an office, you're in your house and you're looking at each other through a computer. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that, Jessica. So I do see a couple other questions coming in the chat. So let me touch on those. Can we ask for feedback after the interview, maybe a few days later and by email? Some advisors say that you must look, you must look confident about your experience, but not arrogant what do you suggest about the tone of the interview? So that's two different questions. So I'll start with Marjorie on the first question. Can we ask for feedback after the interview, maybe a few days later and by email? So I think you have to factor in several aspects here. On the one hand, you want to respect the time that the institution or the person gave you. So for example, if they told you they were going to get back to you, in a month and you're contacting two days afterwards asking for feedback, this might give the wrong impression. But I think there is a way to do it. If you can do it respectfully in an email, maybe following up in a similar time frame to what they told you when they were going to reach out to you. And maybe just like the way you phrase it should not be directly like asking for feedback, but I think it should be maybe written as a thank you note, um, thank you for your time, following up, and also welcoming any comments. And I think that's really important because it happens a lot, and I have seen it several times, that persons apply to a scholarship one time, they do not receive it, but then they reapply, and they have worked on, on, on what they needed to improve, and then they receive the scholarship. So I think this is part of the learning process. Some persons will give you feedback, uh, some maybe will not, but I think you should try to do it in a correct way. Great. And Jessica, you looked like you agreed with Marjorie on that. So did you want to jump in on any of her points? Oh, I just want to touch on the thank you note. I think that's a really good point to bring up. And going back to the previous question of how can you stand out, that is a way you can stand out. After your interview, send just a short email that says, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're a busy person. I really appreciate it. If you need anything more from me, please don't hesitate to reach out. If you have any comments or suggestions, please reach out, reach out to me. And uh, like Marjorie said, you don't know if they'll respond, um, especially on the graduate level, having the faculty or administrators doing the interviews, they are extremely busy people. They may just not respond. Don't take that as a, a blow or anything to you. That just means that they might they probably didn't have time to respond. So don't worry too much about that. Great. Thank you, Jessica. And Greg, I'll ask you this uh, next question that have come in from the audience. 
is it common to be asked about weaknesses in a, oh, I'm sorry, this would actually have to be for Jessica, but maybe I could, um, it could go both ways, I think. So the person has asked, is it common to be asked about weaknesses in graduate school? And if so, is there any advice on how to answer? So I think this question may be about, typically you're asked about, do you have any weaknesses that you would want to, to mention? And how would a student go about answering that? So maybe I'll ask Greg and then Jessica, if you could chime in because they did say specifically graduate school. That might be a question you could ask. I know for Dartmouth, that's not one of the questions we encourage um, alumni to ask. We tend to ask questions more related to um, your experiences uh, and elaborating on those. And then more specifically things about Dartmouth, like why you're applying to Dartmouth and a little bit in that regard. I think that weakness question is one you might get more often in like job interviews and other interview settings. Um, and I think it's just important to try to be reflective uh, with answering that question and self-aware. I think self-awareness is really, really important. And so um, being able to speak to something that you are personally working on um, and maybe how you're going about working on it would be my advice there. But now I'm kind of getting into an area that's outside my expertise. Uh, so this is just kind of my opinion. <laughs> um, uh, so Jessica, do you want to add anything? Yes, um, I think this is a difficult question to talk about. Um, and I agree with Greg that it's, it's more on the job interview side of things. Uh, I would say that in, a, in the graduate context, we may frame this more as what skills are you lacking? What are you in need of? Rather than phrasing it as a weakness, what, are, what can we provide you? What are you in need of? What are you looking for to better yourself? And then that goes right back to everything we've talked about so far. Do your research. What are your goals? And how can this university help you achieve those goals? So rather than thinking of it as weakness, think of it as what do I need in order to succeed more? Okay, thank you so much, Jessica. And um, we have just about eight minutes left. I see that we have one more question that has come in. So um, let me, uh, this would be for both Jessica and for you, Greg. Can you ask somewhat private questions if one gets a chance to ask the interviewer something? Like if it's an alumni interviewing me, why did you choose this college or university? Is that an appropriate question to ask an interviewer? That, that question is definitely appropriate. I think the, the definition you give, one gives to the, the idea of quote unquote private questions is the, the issue here. I think if you wanna ask why someone picked uh, a school that's totally fine. And I would say on this note, I think it's really important because it happens every year. Um, you know, we have a very, th this is probably different for, than it is for Jessica, but for schools that have alumni interviewing at the undergraduate level, especially, we have a very large and very diverse alumni base. And so you may feel uncomfortable. You know, it is possible that you have an interview with somebody that for whatever reason makes you feel uncomfortable. Don't hesitate to reach out, not to the interviewer in that regard, but to the admissions office if that's something that happens and explain what it was that happened so we can get a better understanding and so that we can try to retrain our alumni interviewers. We do have to do that time and again. And there are, of course, instances of alumni interviewers asking a question that you would might deem as an interviewee inappropriate. And so uh, I just wanna give you that little piece of advice that you're never supposed to feel kind of uncomfortable in an interview. It's supposed to be a natural free flowing conversation that allows you both to learn more about each other. So how would you <clears throat> how would you suggest that the person, um, let's say that they're in the interview and a situation like that arises, how do they address it at that point in time? Within the interview, I would say while it's happening to try to redirect the conversation. Um, if it's a question that they've asked that you don't feel comfortable answering, you can just say, I, I don't really feel comfortable answering that question. I prefer we talk about something else. Um, and then, of course, like I said, be sure to follow up with the admissions office about what happened so that we can get a better understanding of the situation and make sure not to include that interview kind of report and to make sure that we're training and retraining our, our interview uh, 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 ambassadors. 
Okay, and Jessica, would you like to add to that in terms of um, asking a somewhat personal or individualized question to the interviewer? Yeah, I think it's, this is more of an undergraduate side of things. Um, since on the graduate level, we're more of, we're more focused on professional, the professional side of your, of your story. Um, so I would say the opportunity to ask these more personal questions won't arise as frequently, but of course, and again, if you're w working with a faculty member, if you're, um, being interviewed by an assistant dean or an administrator, you still have the ability to say that I don't feel comfortable answering that question. You should never shy away from saying that. And if, of course, there's problems, you can always reach out to us at the admissions office and we'll be able to help you out. Okay, thank you so much, Jessica. And um, there's one question that has come um, for you, uh, Greg. During which period of time does Dartmouth releases their interview opportunities, the period in which the alumni contacts the applicant? So it depends on when you apply. If you apply early decision, we usually have alumni reaching out, like, right, so early decision deadline for us is November 1. So you'll receive contact during the month of November, maybe the first week of December for your interview, but it should be done usually in the month of November. And then if you apply regular decision, you'll receive uh, contact from alumni in January or February um, before March when we release decisions. Okay, great. So we just have a few minutes left. So I would like to give all of our panelists an opportunity, if you could, to just leave the students with one insight or tip that you think would be um, very useful in a the interview process, whether it's in the preparation part or during the interview. Um, may I start with you, Marjorie, one bit of advice or tip that you'd like to share with the audience? Thank you. So there are also some cultural factors to consider. For instance, uh, sometimes in Latin culture, we can be very indirect and being direct can be perceived as being unpolite. So these are some of the things that you have to consider, but I would really recommend that when you are in an interview with an institution from the US, that you respond to what is asked in a direct way. And if you don't know the answer, then that is okay, but always uh, speak the truth. Thank you, Marjorie, and you, Jessica, do you have a tip that you'd like to share? I would say that preparation will help you feel less nervous. So I know that sitting in front of somebody and having an interview, your nerves are going to just be all over the place. First of all, know that we understand that it's a nerve wracking thing to do. So don't think that we're taking points off for nerves in no way. Uh, but I would say that doing a practice interview with a family member or a friend you can also watch interviews on YouTube, and I, I've had some people say that that's really helpful as well. So just making sure you're prepared, writing down a list of questions, writing down a list of things you want to hit on, and going into that interview as confident as you can be. Thank you, Jessica, Jessica and Greg. Jessica and Marjorie gave a lot of good ones that I would have used. Um, so I'll go with the end of the interview because they touched on this, but I didn't say it earlier. But thank you note never hurts. Send a thank you note after it's over, especially if the interview did well or interview went well for you and you bonded with the interview. We, I have so many feedback stories that we receive after the admissions cycle is over of people saying to me, oh my gosh, my interviewer was the main reason I'm going to Dartmouth or was the person that really inspired me that they, so follow up with them. They're always excited. They, they volunteer for us. They volunteer their time to do this. It's not a paid opportunity. We don't give them gifts. They just do it because they really love the institution. Um, and so they're excited to hear from you. If you if you get in and you have questions or just to send a thank you note when you're done, it's never a bad idea. Great, thank you. So there you have it. Um, good closing tips there from our expert panelists. So you definitely want to make sure that you are aware of cultural differences and be mindful of that during the interview. Definitely do your research and prepare for the interview beforehand, even if that means doing a practice interview with someone and most definitely sending a thank you note after your interview. 
would be well received. So I think um, we are just at the end of time here for our session. I'd like to say thank you so much to our panelists for being here today and sharing such insightful information and helping our audience be more prepared for interviews. I know I am definitely a lot more prepared in terms of giving students guidance about the interview process now. So thank you so much. And just a reminder to our audience that we do have a session tomorrow on interna um, International Education Week. And our session is about the, um, it's the Education USA International Education Week Business Showcase, which takes place 3 p.m. tomorrow. And the registration link is there for you. So we invite as many of you as possible to please join us for that session. So thank you again to our audience for being here and for all of your questions. And as a reminder, reach out to your Education USA Advising Center for information on studying in the US. And there you have the link for the Education USA website and where you can find an advising center near to you. So everyone, have a good evening and please continue to do well.